afternoon or evening, everyone, um, and welcome to our coffee and EVs, April 25th. It is 7.03. We'll go ahead and get started. And tonight we have a special guest speaker, Nathan Bowen, president of DC America. So I'll let Nathan go ahead and introduce himself a little more and give us uh, sort of an update on what DC America has been up to or any news and EV information that he can share. Thank you, Robert. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Nathan Bowen. Um, I, I grew up in the Huntington area. I currently live in the Barbersville area, but I'm president of DC America. Um, DC America, which I'll show you a slideshow in here in a few minutes, but you know, basically what we're doing is very similar to what Tesla's doing with their prefabricated super, supercharger units. Um, uh, uh, basically a, a steel platform with all the charging equipment, electrical switchboard, panel board, whatever, all pre-wired. So basically a unit arrives to the facility uh, completely constructed. Uh, let me start a slideshow here. So again, we, we design, so basically under our uh, facilities here, we have a group of engineers, structural, civil, electrical. So we're able to turnkey complete facilities uh, design uh, from start to finish. Uh, we also have a manufacturing uh, facility at our uh, uh, Milton, West Virginia location. So we're able to weld. I'll grab my little laser pointer here so I can point around as well. But we can build our steel structural raceway platforms right there in Milton, uh, also painting and blasting facilities. So really what we're trying to do is eliminate as much as possible underground disturbance. Uh, basically, the only wire and conduit would be coming from the utility transformer itself. And you can kind of see this is one that's under construction, but the underground conduit would turn up and the only connections would be on the uh, AC bus in this uh, 2000 amp panel board in this particular case. Um, you know, we create stations from, you know, we can go down to level two chargers. Uh, DC fast charging, fleet depot charging. So pretty much the whole gamut of charging and a mixture of all of them sometimes. Um, in this particular unit you're seeing in the bottom left-hand corner, this was uh, more or less designed as our one of our NEVI solutions. Um, so it's got four 150 kilowatt hour uh, or 150 kilowatt DC fast chargers. Uh, in this case, it has a 2000 amp panel board. And we also, uh, as an option, we will add a display screen for uh, when you start looking into the NEVI formula guidelines, they start talking about uh, community engagement, education, and, and, also, and also can be monetized. So uh, kind of gives Nathan, a better. I was, yeah. was going to interrupt you. You're showing just, it's it's not like we're actually seeing the slides. It's just like you're in the actual PowerPoint application. Okay, I need to share a different again. screen. Let me no. stop it and go back. I'm sorry, guys. All we can see was the, your portable unit <laughs> that you use at the bus terminal somewhere in California. Yeah. Okay. Let's try this again. Yeah, that looks better. Okay. So I will grab, I'll, I'll kind of go back through that just really quickly. But again, the, the underground, so what we're trying to do is eliminate underground disturbance. So typically what you're going to have is utility conduits going from the transformer stubbed up to a concrete foundation that ties into our single point connection. So that's really the basis behind our whole theory and design is, you know, eliminating as much as possible underground disturbance, speeding up deployment, and even enabling uh, redeployment as needed. You know, sometimes you're going to pick a bad location. Um, you could pick it up within a matter of a couple of hours, put it on a semi, move it to the next location. Um, single point connection, what's that mean? I know we got a lot of electrical guys here. I know Marty, you are, but um, you know, when we talk about a single point connection, literally the feed from the transformer is the only connection. So all the wiring, whether it be a split rectifier to a, a dispenser, that's all pre-wired before it leaves our facilities. So in this case, you're seeing parallel feeds a 480 volts hitting a 2000 amp bus bar uh, on an electrical panel board. 
you know, some of the advantages versus our modular construction versus stick belt. Um, in the upper right hand corner here, you can kind of see this is, I believe it's Electrify America station. Uh, it's out front of a Walmart somewhere out west. I think it was actually in Colorado, but you see all the underground conduits. Um, and what you're looking at here is, you know, electrical uh, uh, panel board, distribution board, uh, going to rectifier units and then going back out to dispensers, communication cabling. I mean, there is a bunch of conduit that goes into some of the higher power stations. Uh, we eliminate the majority of that. Uh, it's all encapsulated into our structural raceway. So some of the advantages is, you know, in a manufactured environment, environment uh, quality control in-house, you know, typically when you get out the field, um, I mean, sometimes you see HVAC guys putting this in, sometimes, you know, it's hard to say who's putting in some of these stations sometimes. So inconsistent quality, uh, we're able to get firm prices Whereas a typical stick built construction, you know, you might run into rock, you know, other issues like that. Firm delivery, weather delays, you know, in a, in a construction, uh, field construction aspect. Time savings. Uh, another thing, too, with the NEVI formula, uh, you'll see a lot of mentioning of EVITP trained electricians, uh, not only in installing this equipment, but also servicing it. Uh, we have upwards of a dozen guys right now that are EVITP trained. Uh, we've got, I think, five guys currently, which I'm one of them, that are EVITP trainers. So, you know, we're, we're putting a huge emphasis on training. Um, you know, from what I've seen of the EV industry, it, it's a West Coast game for the most part. The majority of talent or, um, you know, qualified people are typically on the West Coast. So it's a it's kind of a, a desert on the East Coast when it comes to people that can work on them. Uh, that's why you see the atrocious downtimes and uptimes, you know, uh, that you see out there with Electrify America and some of the others. Um, single source responsibility. You know, we, we basically give you a package that uh, everything shows up at once. You don't have to worry about multiple vendor shipments, chargers, electrical, you know, uh, it just ties up a construction site. And typically it's a, you know, gas station or whatever where their real estate is uh you know, worth a lot to them. They don't. They do not want to tie their site up uh, very long at all. Um, safety. You know, that's a big thing that um, you know you run into in the field a lot of times. Is the longer you're you have ditches open, the longer you have conduit open, uh, rebar. You know, there's just a lot more uh, uh, higher safety risk out there. Um, and what that ends up being is you know basically a life cycle cost reduction. Um, some of our designs uh, we've come with, up with, um, you know, we're, we're brand agnostic. We use multiple vendors of chargers. So what you see on top, these are actually the ABB Terra 184s, um, a different design there. You know, one design I've really been pushing for across Nevi is a, a pull-through solution uh, for EVs pulling trailers. Um, you know, I'm sure you guys have seen it, but, you know, straight pull in EV charging is very difficult if you're pulling trailers. Uh, so basically what we have in this design is three pull in dispensers and then a pull through application where you could, you know, potentially use a bus, a class eight tractor, uh, you know, pickup truck with the trailer, lots of options, but basically you have the pull through so they, they have the room to be able to charge. Um, and to kind of show you a stripped down version of what we're doing, and again, we have tons of different uh, designs and applications, but what what is the heart of our system is the structural raceway. So all the cabling resides in this structure itself. Uh, lifting hooks for us to be able to pick these up with cranes are all inside this. These are removable uh, quarter inch diamond plated plates, so they're very heavy duty. I mean, you could literally drive a semi truck. Uh, you know, when you look at all the steel bracing in this, this is a very heavy unit. Uh, eight by six inch, I believe, steel tubing uh, encompasses it. Uh, so it's very sturdy. That that actual bottom plate is three quarter inch plate steel. So in this case, in order to meet ADA compliance, we actually had to drop down uh, the mounting uh, arrangement for the charger dispensers themselves to keep the controls at 48 inches. And, and one thing we try to build in our systems as well is, um, you know, we're trying to think of expansion in the future. 
uh, and minimally disturbing the ground when we do that. So this open port in the end enables us to uh, basically expand the system from four dispensers, uh, which is the NEVI requirement currently. You could set another platform right next to it and utilize the same electrical gear, the same uh, structural raceway and feed the next unit on down the line. Um, and I said this early, we're, we're brand agnostic. Um, it, you know, we've done a lot of work for bus and fleets. Uh, currently, that seems like it's the majority of our business right now, but ABB, Rhombus, Delta, Lincoln, BTC, Power Electronics, Saltel, Heliox, um, you know, we use a lot of different brands. Uh, just depends on the application. You know, like in the, the, the charger you see here on the left, that's more of a uh, kind of an industrial fleet application. It doesn't have credit card readers or anything like that. So it's a 180 kilowatt charger. Um, it has the capability of dynamically uh, shifting load to two other dispensers. So a total of three dispensers. Uh, it can share 180, uh, 120, 60, 60, 60, 60. You know, any different arrangement of that that adds up to uh, 180 kilowatt. This unit, Marty kind of mentioned it earlier, but um, this is a unit we've been building for folks that kind of have uh, fleets that are on the move. You know, maybe some pilot programs that they've bought some trucks and they're kind of moving them from location to location to see how they work in different geographic locations. Um, you know, the intention of this is to give them the option to you know, be able to fork truck this unit, put it in the back of a pickup. Uh, you could put it on the back of a, you know, flatbed truck, whatever. But we already have, uh, on the next slide, I'll show you this, but 480 volts, uh, basically like a heavy duty extension cord is already connected to this. And we have a means of uh, storing the cable behind this unit so they can efficiently and safely move these. This is actually one of them in use out in LA. Um, what we call a last mile food delivery service. Um, one of the larger ones in the country, they purchased 30 Freightliner E Cascadias uh, as a pilot program. They're moving them around to multiple locations throughout the United States. Uh, we built them three of these uh, so they could basically move them from location to location with their charger, with their trucks. Uh, you can kind of see in this application, it, it has that heavy duty extension cord and they pre roughed in uh, at their facility, uh, 480 volts uh, with a twist lock connection. So it makes for an easy uh, startup. So, you know, overall, you know, what we see with our system, you know, I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, but I'm an electrical contractor as well. I'm involved in electrical contracting business in Huntington. But when we compared cost of installation of our uh, modular setup versus stick built construction, uh, especially in the larger stations, we can see up to 50% installation cost savings just by eliminating all the underground conduit, pulling the wire, uh, you know, the efficiency of billing it into in a uh, uh, manufactured, uh, you know, conditioned environment. Um, engineering savings, you know, we're, we're able to, for lack of a better term, cookie cutter these, you know, make the same design every time, uh, the same studies go along with this, you know, arc flash, all that kind of stuff. We're able to replicate that over and over and over again without reinventing the wheel each time. Um, deploying days, not weeks. Uh, you know, typically if it's a made ready site, conduits there, wires pulled, um, we can actually have a station up in operational less than a day. Uh, in some instances, potentially two days. But you know, before these leave our facilities, we're also pre-commissioning these and charging cars uh, before they leave our facility. So that really uh, quickens up the deployment as well. Redeployment capabilities. Um, one of the largest interests we get is folks that uh, do not own their land. You would be surprised at how many big box stores or uh, warehouses that lease property. Um, you know, what we do is basically give them the option to move their whole infrastructure to the next location without losing the investment uh, of the underground conduit and wire. Um, small footprint, you know, big capacity. When you look at what we do, we basically, when you look at a Tesla supercharger station, typically, um, if they don't use the PSU system, you know, you see the rectifiers and the gear all behind the fence. 
uh, and it's kind of taking up a little more real estate, whereas we're putting it all on the same platform, uh, single point connection. Um, you know, it's using up a lot less foot footprint uh, as opposed to especially Electrify America, folks like that. Um, so, you know, we're, we're seeing some interest in that, too, for folks that have minimal um, real estate. So that, that's pretty much all I got, guys. Um, feel free to ask away. I'm sure you have questions. <laughs> uh, this is Marty. Uh, just wondered uh, if you could tell us a little about what's the market like out there for a small guy versus a, the biggest electrical contractors in the world like ABB. You know, are you going up head to head against those guys, aren't you? Or are you buying stuff from them or both? No, I mean, you'd be surprised. Um, I mean, I can't, I've got NDAs. I can't really talk about what we're doing, you know, yeah. per se about everything, but um, you would be this, you'd be surprised about the interest they have in what we're doing. Uh, they don't really look at, at themselves as a competitor to us. I mean, they just want to sell equipment. Um, and, and they see us as, more of a differentiating factor. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that put in charging stations. You know, it's, it's easy to find people that will run the conduit or the concrete. But what we do, uh, especially in the United States, there's very, very few people, if any, that specifically do a pre-manufactured station. Um, we're seeing probably more uh, traction in the fleets, buses, arena. Um, I think the commercial charging sector is kind of bogged down with everybody's waiting on Nevi. Um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's gone a lot slower than what I thought with Nevi. And this is across the country. It's not just a West Virginia thing. I mean, pretty much every state in the country has uh, really slowed it down. I think Ohio is the only one that's actually bid. It went through an RFP process. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're getting a lot of interest. I mean, we're getting global interest. You know, there's people that's contacting us from, Europe, um, you know, Turkey, you know, all over the place, um, you know, interested in what we're doing and potentially looking to implement what we do with their equipment or, you know, their particular projects. That's really neat right here in West Virginia. That's, and it's really outgrowth of the natural gas industry, right? I mean, you have experience. Yeah, that's building correct. Units. Yeah. So DC America was established out of, two different companies, um, Synergy, which was a, a turnkey uh, oil and gas, uh, not only station constructor, but they manufacture, pre-manufactured um, uh, measurement and regulation equipment on modular skids and ship them across the United States. I'm involved with Dixon Electrical Systems in Huntington as well. Uh, we've been partners with Synergy for approximately a decade or more. Um, we did a lot of the electrical work, instrumentation, uh, control work on all this oil and gas equipment. So we already had all the equipment, the infrastructure, the cranes, uh, welding, blasting, painting, you know, all of these capabilities under our roofs. Uh, we just kind of switch gears slightly and apply it to EV charging. So one final question, at least for me, what the hell's going on with West Virginia? <laughs> I mean, I mean are, are we ever going to see any DC fast charging in West Virginia? Are they? You, you'll be surprised, that? Marty. It's coming. I mean, I promise you that. Um, you know, th they're not the only ones that are are trying to figure out what's going on with the Federal Highway Administration. I mean, I think they're they're doing a, a good job at this. Um, I think their Nevi plan was good. Um, just be patient. It's coming. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's going to be great for all of us. You know, it's, uh, we definitely need some infrastructure. You know, I'll mention, I'll mention this as well. And this is not really talked about much here. Like everybody wants to talk about Nevi formula. Um, Nevi discretionary, uh, was just released in, uh, I think it was middle of March. So that, uh, opens the, the door to a lot of other opportunities for smaller communities. Um, Nevi discretionary is a little different than the formula. Uh, it gives you the opportunity to basically put charging wherever you want. 
Uh, it doesn't have to be 150 kilowatt. It can be combinations of level two DC fast charging. So there's opportunities for cities to get them, you know, get charging. Um, it, it, it's still a little hard for some of them to stomach the price of what it truly takes to do this. Uh, but there are grant opportunities and they can get funded 80% from the federal government. I think, I think rap, uh, rap, you have a question. Yeah. Go ahead, rap. From Troutwood, Ohio. I'm the president of Glad the Levy Dayton. Uh, yes, I was wondering what I'm, I'm talking to school districts about putting in chargers for diesel school, but uh, for electric school buses. Uh, and I was wondering to set up a network like that. Um, what is the general cost for a school district these days? And have you done it already? Yeah, that's something we're looking at a lot currently. Um, you know, the Department of Energy, I think it was, released the Clean Bus Grant Program, uh, which West Virginia sadly only got five buses. Um, I'm not sure how many Ohio got. It was considerably more than that. Uh, it was. So, you know, with that program, uh, they got they get approximately two hundred eighty thousand dollars per bus, or maybe it's three hundred thousand. But twenty thousand is set aside for charging for the buses. It, the problem is with that, you know, some buses um, are only CCS connected buses. Mm -hmm. So when you start getting into DC fast charging, that's a difficult budget to work with twenty thousand dollars, especially when you start talking the electrical gear. Uh, the service required to bring that in. Uh, now, some of these are, can be level two bus or level two charged, as well as uh, DC fast charge. Uh, you know, I'll go back to the NEVI discretionary. Um, one of the things they mention a lot in NEVI discretionary is the opportunity for school districts to get funding, which they could get up to eighty percent funding uh, for systems that could be used for buses. Now, the only caveat is it has to be publicly available. So they would have to work out some kind of deal where it would be publicly available. Um, you know, as far as cost of chargers, I mean, it's like cars, you know, you can get a $10,000 car and you can get a $100,000 car. You know what I mean? There's there's a lot of stuff in between. Um, you can get some charging for $20,000. I'm not gonna say you can't charge a bus for $20,000, but what happens, especially in rural areas, you'll see a lot of routes with buses. Um, when you start getting buses that have longer than say about a 60 or 70 mile route, they, they have to charge midday. Uh, most of the electric buses out there right now currently have about 130, 140 mile range. Um, it, it gets to the point where they almost have to have DC fast charging in the midday to be able to get that afternoon run in. So. It's really a consulting sell. I mean, you, you really have to take in a lot into consideration uh, when you look at buses, just the way the routes are, uh, what bus they have. You know, there's a huge difference in battery capacity on buses out there. I mean, you'll see some that have 155 uh, kilowatt hour batteries. Uh, the Thomas Julie has a 226 kilowatt hour battery. I think IC has one that's up to 300 kilowatt hour. So, you know, there's there's so many variables, it's truly hard to say, nail down a cost because you almost have to look at the application and you know what that county is trying to do. But I would highly recommend that they look into NEVI discretionary. It's a very fast hitting, um, the grant applications are due by May 30th. It's either May 30th or May 31st. So they have very little time to make that happen. Well, to put in, to put in Electrify America fast charging units, is about a million dollars. So people look at that and go, we can't do that. Where if, you know, you could talk to a municipality and they could spend a hundred thousand dollars and do DC fast charging, small cities may look at that. So can a small city put in a decent DC fast charging unit for a hundred thousand dollars? Yeah, I mean, you're going to, you're not going to be getting 150 kilowatt hour chargers, but you don't need that for a bus. I mean, most of these buses won't accept more than like the Thomas Julie's like a 90 kilowatt top. I think okay. the green power is 60. Um, so, I mean, for most buses, you need a, a lower end DC fast charger, you know, 40, 60, 90, somewhere in that range, uh, kilowatt hour. So, yeah, it's possible. You could do something for under 100,000. Now, it depends on how many buses you want to do as well. Um, but 
there are options. There are cheaper options um, that some of these folks could do. Uh, there's some reasonable 25 to 60 kilowatt hour uh, or kilowatt DC fast chargers that can be bought. Thank you. Yes, sir. And Nathan, I, I think you've probably already answered this, but uh, I presume there have not been any NEVI installations that you're aware of or that you guys have been involved with at this time yet. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, right now, Robert, the only state that I know of that's actually put out an RFP uh, is Ohio. Right. Um, and that's, you know, it was, uh, they they were aggressive. You know, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but. Um, and I think I actually saw something, maybe they, they either pulled it back or they made some changes or something because of the Buy America provisions. Or anyway, it was yeah, going to cause some, some issues. Yeah, Buy America, I mean, it changed some. Um, it, you know, basically with Buy America currently, it has to be assembled in the United States per NEVI, and then the steel enclosure has to be U.S.-made smelted steel. So, you know, I think Ohio, you know, they, they wanted to be one of the first out there, and they were very aggressive with this, and I applaud them for that. But, you know, the FHWA kind of took a while to give that final guidance on what BAA does. Um, and it would somewhat affect potentially what those bids were because people didn't know one way or the other uh, what truly uh, Buy America meant at the time. So, so have you seen any bids from uh, people still spending the Volkswagen money? I understand uh, both Ohio and New Mexico have have gone out and are putting in some spots with the with the Volkswagen money. Of course, West Virginia spent its Volkswagen money on snow plows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I've seen some stuff already. Um, you know, a lot of times the way we bid work is we don't necessarily go to market as a, a CPO or a charge point operator. You know, we're more or less looking to sell to the CPOs to kind of give them an easy button uh, to where they don't have to worry about the installation. So sometimes I'm not, I'm not saying all the time. I mean, I will be a CPO in certain instances where it's best for the customer and me. Um, but, you know, we're really trying to make a market of, building infrastructure and speeding this all up you know that's what we're trying to do there's a lot of people that do the cpo game and uh, you know a lot of people in that not, that's not at this point what we're interested in okay well it's really been wonderful thanks for telling us what's going on because yes. uh... i'm not saying we wouldn't do the cpo ever marty but there yeah. are cases where we will but when you look at the nationwide uh, what all is being built, there's a huge need for, uh, you know, qualified people that can completely assemble, um, you know, a station and give somebody a really easy to install system. I mean, all you have to do is just run the service from the transformer to the unit. We take care of all the uh, control cabling, all that kind of stuff. So, so Rap has another question. My other yeah. question. What is your fastest uh, level two charger that you sell to customers? 19.2. Yeah. Okay. Which uh, is the maximum under the, the standard, I believe. That's correct. Can you give me a general cost without being, you know, too particular on what that unit will cost to get installed for a level two? I, I mean, there's so many variables. I mean, I think I've seen advertised, you know, Tesla expected like $3,000 or something like that, you know, total install or something like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, there's so many variables, you know, it just depends on what electrical service is available. If you have to saw cut concrete, um, you know, it, it's just hard to give numbers on something like that. And, it, you know, is it managed, unmanaged? Um, you know, you can get unmanaged level two chargers pretty cheap. Uh, managed charters are a bit more expensive. Uh, if you want credit card readers on it, I mean that that ups the cost. Uh, yeah, there's just a lot of a lot of different variables. Would yeah. you come to Ohio and install chargers, level two chargers? You know, I, I would. Uh, I'd, I'll talk to you about it. Um, 
I mean, we're just right across the border here. You know what I mean? That's, uh, um, I was just in Cincinnati this weekend. I bought a car this weekend. So, um, we travel through Cincinnati quite often. I, I've got, uh, electrical licenses across the United States. So, I mean, we can, when I was in the oil and gas industry, uh, we had to get licenses as far west as Arizona. So, uh, we're capable of doing that. Yes. Well, Charge Point is doing a lot of the bidding in Dayton, and we'd like to have other choices uh, besides just that with product that we can count on and that's reliable. Yeah. You know, Rap, what, really what we're trying to sell is the total solution. Um, we typically don't get into just single installations of chargers. Uh, now, I, I feel like what we do uh, can uh, reduce cost in a lot of applications, you know, because you don't have to dig uh, for the most part. Um, you know, I've looked at some large installations of 199 plus mm -hmm. level two chargers and we were very competitive. Now, if it's only one or two, it's a little more difficult for us to be competitive, you know, just in volume with what we do. I will say probably something more like a fleet installation if somebody needed a bunch yeah. of level twos kind yeah. of deal. Exactly. Or an airport or something like that. Yeah, something large. What done hurt to ask? That's right. <laughs> well, maybe he can point you to the right guy, though. Sounds like you need an off off meeting discussion. Yep, like we do. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right. Any other questions uh, for Nathan while we got him? So did you buy an EV, Nathan? It's, this is actually my second EV. I, I wrecked. I can tell you a quick story if you have time. Sure. I, I had a Model S. I wrecked it oh, no. two Fridays ago. <laughs> and uh, was hydro, hydroplane. Uh -huh. um, but the, the funny part of this story is, is I, I get a call from the um, record company today that, you know, picked up my vehicle. And uh, and I'm sure he 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 was taught this in a class, but basically he told me, he said, his insurance company said that I needed to get, well, let me back up a little bit. It's set in this record yard for over a week, and my insurance company has yet to get a uh, another record to haul it to Lexington to go to a uh, certified le or a Tesla collision center. So this car is set there for over a week, but the record company that currently has my vehicle is saying that they need this vehicle moved immediately because their insurance company is throwing a fit about it being parked there. Uh, the environmental impact and all this of, you know, potentially the battery, the fire, <laughs> you know, all this <laughs> stuff. So uh, I never heard that one before. Yeah. If, if you're, one in Lexington doesn't work out. There is Beachmont Ford in Cincinnati Collision Center that is Tesla certified. I'm pretty sure the car's totaled. Oh, um, okay. But I, I I can't. They won't send an adjuster out. They want to tow it all the way two hours away to to uh, confirm that's, that. So that's crazy. Yeah. Pretty so what'd you end up getting? So I actually, I found the 21 uh, Model S Plaid. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so that, that thing's it, pretty fun. It'll never hydroplane. It'll be going too fast for <laughs> hydroplane. <laughs> Apparently, you like to drive fast. <laughs> but it's, it's actually my wife's, mostly. Um, we actually, you know, Dixon Electrical Systems in Huntington, we purchased a Ford Lightning as well, so... We've kind of got that in the fleet too to use it for testing and all that. So, uh, yeah, that's we're trying to switch our fleet over as it makes sense. You know, more local trucks uh, in Dixon's fleet to um, EVs. And as they, I mean, it, it's currently the Lightnings are somewhat unreasonable in a lot of ways, price wise, uh, for a work truck. Um, but you know, we definitely have a plan to do that. I mean, it definitely makes sense for us to uh, financially you know, reduce fuel costs, all that. So. All right. Great. Well, we'll have, we'll be excited to hear more about what your experience is like with the plan. Yeah. If, uh, if it is total, I'm sure that, uh, J.R. Strobel would love the battery. Red yeah. Red. It's, I mean, it's a little older model is a 2014 model, but, uh, I mean the body, it hardly, hardly hurt the body. It just destroyed the train or the, uh, 
suspension, and I'm pretty sure the rear drive is a performance P85, but uh, pretty sure the motor is destroyed in the back as well. John, did you have something? I was going to just ask if you had quit, if you had pictures. <laughs> no. <laughs> I do have pictures. Are you wanting to see them? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, picture right. didn't happen. Let me see if I can find them. Give Larry, do you have a question? Yeah, <clears throat> Nathan, uh, you say you're manufacturing in uh, Milton? Yes, sir. Uh, about how many people do you employ? So, you know, kind of the, the good thing about this business model, I mentioned earlier that uh, – we have two other companies involved, Synergy and uh, uh, Dixon Electrical Systems. You know, currently we, we're able to kind of pull in and send back as needed. So it's a lot easier on a startup. But Dixon Electrical Systems, we keep eh, approximately 80 to 100 electricians. Uh, the Synergy aspect, we're probably talking upwards of 150 to 200 employees at any given time. Um, you know, probably in our office, we're more of a marketing slash estimating department now with some engineering. Uh, we're upwards of eight or so in our office there in Milton on the D.C. side. Like I said, we, we use labor from Dixon and Synergy currently. OK, hang on, I've I got it up here, guys. Hang on just a second. It's not going to make me cry, is it? It might. Sorry, my computer's kind of slow. Where is it at? Well, we're not on Teams. I'm sorry. I was on my way. I went over to Delaware for a couple of days. I've been out of town. And uh, so I was on my way back yesterday. And me and a P85D just kept trading places uh, in Delaware and on the interstate. So I was looking at, yep, looks like <laughs> P85, uh -huh. yep. So it trashed the suspension on the front. Uh, uh, two big chunks taken out of the wheel. Um, that right there, there's no hurt. It didn't hurt the hood at all. It just crinkled the fender slightly. This just popped out um, in the back. What's amazing is the body did not even touch the wall, but that wheel is sitting at about a, I don't know, a 40 degree angle, trashed the suspension. Fairly certain that the motor, drive motor is, uh, I, I tried, it, I happened in the middle of Interstate 64 and I tried to get it out of the middle of the road because it was raining very hard. It was dark. It went about 10 feet and it just started grinding. So. Thanks for sharing it. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> that's probably not going to buff out. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's probably what they're so not. concerned about. They want a uh, containment pond. For that vehicle to keep it from leaking toxic uh toxic materials <laughs> so well i'm sorry i got news for him if it was going to happen it already happened <laughs> yeah he actually told me as well he said when they towed it off the interstate it should have had a fire truck escort <laughs> well was there any damage to the battery doesn't look like it no nah, there's no damage to the battery yeah, they don't know what they're talking about. No. Nah. Well, thanks for having me, guys. Um, well, thank you. It's really good to know what's going on. Because yes. uh, you can't imagine the frustration we see in our uh, discussion groups. Uh, and personally, I mean, people buy electric cars and they just don't understand. There's nowhere to plug them in in West Virginia. Yeah. And then they sell them. Yeah, I'll leave you with this. If you know some towns, if you know some folks that are very interested in potentially the discretionary funding, uh, you know, we're, we're putting together a package that actually will finance for five years, um, you know, the 20 percent. So basically they would defer a payment for the complete first year uh, and then finance the 20 percent of this for five years. Now, one thing to keep in mind with discretionary and there, there are some uh, potential ways around this, but they prefer a minimum grant application of $500,000.
uh, up to $15 million. So, you know, that, that kind of puts a lot of small towns out of the picture because even a 20% uh, fund of $500,000 is difficult for some small communities. Yeah. But we are encouraging people if you're interested. Uh, we've got a grant writer working on this. Uh, like I said, we have a, a reputable local leasing uh, financing company that's offering financing for this. Uh, where I mean, we're trying to minimize the impact as much as possible and give them an option to uh, potentially get into this game. Well, this, the grant claims that it's supposed to serve underserved communities. And at that kind of money, it's not going to serve anybody. You yeah, it, it's almost like these were intended for people to group. Um, but the, I mean, the problem is in small rural communities, they can't do that. I mean, it's it's great for you know, Cincinnati or something like that, where you might be able to put four or five stations in. Uh, you know, rural West Virginia, you just can't group enough stations in a small, rural, disadvantaged, uh, whatever, Justice 40 community uh, to be able to do this. It's just, it's a bit frustrating, but. Uh, Dayton, Ohio, have a, Dayton, Ohio will have a hard problem doing it as big as it is. So yeah. you know what's going to happen to small communities. Yeah. But see, yeah. that's, I'll, I'll say this just to make sure I make myself clear. The discretionary goes to the Federal Highway Administration. It does not go through the states. So the grant application would go to the FHWA. Right. Yep. Okay. Well, I know the city of Nitro has been talking to people. Weren't they talking to you for a while? And, and uh, did they defer that when Nevi came along? Because there's a, oh, I've heard there's this fear of, okay, I go out and I spend all my money to put in a 100 kilowatt station and Nevi comes in put three blocks away and puts in a 200 kilowatt station and no one ever uses mine i'm stuck with all the costs is that an issue you've seen I, you know i mean i could see where some people think that marty but i, I mean when you if, if ev adoption truly heads where they say it's going um and I think it is. I mean, I was out in Vegas uh, back in January. You know, I was at a, a Tesla station there for three hours. I was looking at a, a, a potential installation there uh, just down from the strip. The whole time I was there, every slot was filled. There's 10 of them, minimum of five cars waiting in line. Uh, after talking to the uh, owner of that property, they have on average per dispenser 24 uses per day. Um they would have more if there was more chargers, you know, I mean, wouldn't have it per, per dispenser, but if they had more dispensers, they would have more people charging. So I guess what I'm getting at is, I, I mean, it would make sense to me that there's EV charging at every exit in five to seven years. Um, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I think you're going to need it. Uh, Nitro. Especially I mean, I big think, destinations like, like you're saying, like Vegas. Yeah. Uh, I was over in Rehoboth Beach. They've got two superchargers within four miles of each other in Rehoboth. And when I was over there, and you know, this isn't prime time yet. We're we're not even in May. One of them, when I was there on Sunday, was almost full. The other one was about half full. And te Tesla's building another 12 stall station in the, in between the two stalls, two stations that are already there. So they're going to have in a th four mile strip. They're going to have three superchargers. Wow. With a total of 28 stalls. <laughs> well, well, there's this place in between L.A. and Vegas, Quartzsite, Arizona. has a population of about 12 people. And they, they put in, uh, originally, like like uh, eight years ago, they put in a six stall. And they're notorious. And that was like 120 kW. They're notorious stories of those being backed up for hours. And then they put in a 24 stall and upgraded the six that were there for a total of 30. And that's backed up. So now they're putting in another 80 stalls, and that's under construction right now. Mm -hmm. I just saw a video. So they're going to have a, and there's all kinds of places in California that they're putting in 100 stall stations. It, it's, 
it's going crazy. It's going crazy all over the country. Well, I mean, I mean, California is, you know, obviously the 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 800 pound gorilla with EVs. But even here on the East Coast, we've got we've got some destinations where, especially during peak times, I mean, you could be hard pressed to serve the number of cars. I was in North Carolina, and I I I stop at Electrify America because you know I own a Volkswagen ID four, uh, and there are places in North Carolina where there's only four stalls, and you have to wait 15 minutes before you can charge. And that's North Carolina. So what happens when uh, people start buying tons and tons of these cars? Mm -hmm. I think you stations on every four corners in a lot of places, right? I, I'm not worried about Nathan's business. He's going to be busy. <laughs> oh, yeah. He's going to be busy. Marty, you Absolutely. mentioned Nitro is interested in charging, but South Charleston's also had applied for a grant. Well, is there any way a bunch of West Virginia towns could go together? And get one of these half million dollar things. You, know, you absolutely put- could. Absolutely, it's just it's such a small period of time to make this happen. Or why uh, has to know, by May thirty first? Yeah. Oh geez. But you know, you, you we have to have time to write the grants. You know what I mean? And it, you know, there's a lot of information that goes into these grants. It takes time to put it together. It's just. Um, it's did, difficult to say the did least. They, did they tell you they won't take it if it's less than half a million? They do not say that. They they say that they will. Basically, what they're going to do is evaluate all the applications. Uh, they'll basically, I'm kind of paraphrasing this, but put them in several different groups. So you actually have two different versions of that. And if, if I need to shut up, guys, just tell me because I can talk forever about this stuff. But you have community charging, and then you have corridor charging as part of discretionary. So corridor is just like Navi formula, but it's going to fill in the blanks even more on the interstates. Um, Same deal. It's got to be within one mile. Uh, It does not have to be uh, designated like Navi formula does on the AFC every 50 miles. You can fill in the blanks. Community is the one that gives you the ultimate flexibility. You can put level two, whatever, uh, but you have, you can apply for less, but in my opinion, I think they're looking for probably the easier route, uh, which would be larger grant applications, uh, less paperwork. Mm-hmm. I'm just reading between the lines. Um, that's kind of what it, you know, they, they said specifically they wanted a minimum of $500,000. They say that for a reason. Um, and they want you to do the homework and try to group these communities together, but that's difficult. I mean, especially in a month and a half, you know, to make that happen. You know, most cities, they don't meet more than once a month. You know, the, the city council does. You can't make a decision that quick. Uh, with funding. And these are reimbursable grants, too. So these cities have to come up with the cash up front to do this. Now, with my financing plan, I basically cover that for up to a year. Uh, which gives them a lot of flexibility. But again, I mean, small communities, disadvantaged communities, that's very difficult to swallow that kind of funding. And if West Virginia doesn't take those funds, then aren't they allocated to other states and other communities that will apply for them? Yeah, absolutely. It, it's not necessarily just for West Virginia. You know, they'll they'll just, they'll take grant applications across the country and shift it wherever. Wherever the money can. So if we don't do it in Ohio and in West Virginia, in Indiana, believe me, California will suck up the money before we know it, and yep. the infrastructure will go there. So we've got a real problem with that. Yep. Well, thanks for the alert, Nathan. We'll see what we if there's anything we can do to facilitate. This. Yeah, I want to make you know I said this once before, Marty, but this isn't a West Virginia DOT thing. They have nothing to do with discretionary. So right, I understand. It's, it's kind of a call out to the municipalities, metropolitan planning organizations, uh, you know, people like that. I mean, well, and Nathan, you know. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but won't this, I mean, I know that this discretionary, I mean, isn't there going to be a cycle every year for this? And then I know that this is, yeah, for five years. So yeah, for this year, May 31st just isn't going to, obviously that's just too tight of a turnaround, but if you know it's coming and basically you can start getting your ducks in a row and lining things up, maybe get ready for next year. That that would be my advice. I mean, I think yeah. as an organization, as you know, I'd like to get some of these MPOs involved, but you know, 
let's group a bunch of people. You know, I, I tell you a great application. I've talked to them and they're thinking about this, but uh, the Department of Education in West Virginia just purchased, uh, what, 44 green power uh, beast buses, $15 million right. worth. This is a great opportunity uh, to get charging. You know, you could group all those together. Um, and, and they're they're interested in this. They're looking at it. So um, it's just very short time I'm trying to get a lot of people to communicate. And it's, that's difficult. It's just um, to make it happen. But we're trying. Well, I mean, it sounds like on the city front, community front, I mean, if we've got Nitro and South Charleston that are interested um, and, you know, if you could find some other communities in the area, I don't know, maybe you could look at the 64 corridor. If we could yeah. group some cities in that area together, I don't know if Charleston and Huntington could be interested as the anchors on each end or something. Yeah, I'm actually meeting with the green team from uh, Charleston Friday. They're coming to tour our facilities. And, oh, Emmett? Uh, yes. So, you know, this is something definitely I'm going to talk to them about. I've, I've talked to Huntington about it. They're aware. Um, I think Nitro is definitely going to apply for it. Um, so. There, you know, there's some just, outfit in Huntington called Path. You talk to them? Uh, no, sir. Okay. When we were at uh, Earth Day, we had a, you know, like you were there last year. Uh, they had some some group came up to us and said, "We're organizing all the EV charging in Huntington." <laughs> and <laughs> the name was Path, so we got yeah, over here. <laughs> wow, that's nice to know. We've never I'll heard look of him up there. Okay. Um, well, before, I know we're getting close to the end of the hour, so just a couple uh, things to mention. Um, I know Rick sent out an email. I know he's not on tonight, but he sent out an email looking for three to five EVs for a Saturday in May at Bob Evans uh, at the Huntington Mall. So if uh, just putting that out there, if uh, we've got folks who are in the area, who could uh, help out with something like that and bring their vehicle, uh, definitely reach out to Rick. Uh, he sent that uh, message out on the uh, email list. So uh, if you could help out, please do. Wanted to mention that. Um, and then also, is there one other thing? Uh, my event up here in the Eastern Panhandle got, uh, we weren't able to do it on the date that I had selected because of the weather. So I'm going to reschedule that for May also. So I'll be doing a probably a Saturday in May, mid-May for the event up here. I don't know if, I don't think we've got any Eastern Panhandle folks on, but uh, if anybody wants to take a road trip, <laughs> you're very welcome to uh, join and I'll send that out. I just want to say thank you very much, Nathan. Really appreciate it. We learned it, a lot. Yeah. You're welcome. Appreciate it very much. Yeah, I agree, Nathan. Thanks much. Thank you all for having me. Does Is, anyone I, else have any announcements or news before we uh, before things wrap up? I just what, got one what? thing, Nathan. If you can come up with something we can hand out as a flyer, where we can go to our municipalities, we would. I know I would be willing to distribute that as. As, a, as you as a source for uh, the Nevi uh, alternative or, or whatever that was called. Discretionary funding. Discretionary yeah. Funding. yeah, I couldn't think of it for a second. Thanks. I'll, I'll see if I can't put something together and send it to Robert and he can distribute it to you guys as needed. I, I have his email, so that'd be easiest for me. Yep, that, that's fine. Scott, did you have something? I was just going to ask, you were talking about various cities between Huntington and Charleston. Is Milton thinking of putting one in, being your hometown for your company? Uh, <laughs> you know, we, we potentially, we've talked about, we have a demo unit. Um, I'm probably going to put it live there in Milton. It's got a couple of 75 kilowatt hour or kilowatt DC, DC fast charters. Um, Probably going to do that here fairly soon. I mean, don't don't take that to the bank, but uh, no, no. And I'm not we're, trying we're, to put you on the spot. It'd just be a yeah. good advertising that your own city has them. Yeah. So, <laughs> so at the at the um, at the car show, uh, your guy that was there, you weren't. I missed you both both days. I went there, but uh, 
your guy was there invited me to come out and test out my CCS to Tesla uh, adapter. Have you ever tested one of those? Do you still need that to be tested anywhere? I'll be glad to come out and do that. I just, I kind of forgot yeah, about I it. I mean, if you want to come by, Mar, you're more than welcome. Um, I, I've got a, an, one of the pre-Tesla branded versions of it. I've tested it. I've tested the Chatamo adapters. I've never tested a Tesla brand one. Uh, I'm buying one. Actually, I've got an eBay uh, auction going tonight, so hopefully I'll get one tonight. But um, oh, that sounds like you don't need me then. So yeah, I mean, you're welcome to come. Any of y'all are anytime. Just let me know, and uh, I mean, I'd be glad to show y'all around. Uh, you know, uh, I'll extend that invitation. Very good, Robert. I just thought of something else. I heard on the radio that the Sternware Regatta is going to have some sort of car show. It's not going to be the old doo-wop. I don't know the details, but I'll do some checking and see if we can have some representation in it. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. Let's see if get it's some details. What, something like the 29th or 30th of June through July 4th. Hmm. Well, thank you, Nathan. Rap, hey, it's great to see you again. Well, you know, we've been busy. We just did the Cincinnati Auto Show with uh, Drive Electric Cincinnati, and we did it in front of 25,000 people, by the way. Oh, wow. uh, and what they did, it was sort of cool in Cincinnati. They took 20, uh, 44 EVs and put them in one space. And uh, 25,000 people got a chance to look at, you know, all the various different EVs that exist right now that you can buy. And that was uh, – that was really cool. So that's great. So we, you know, with Cincinnati and Dayton right now is pretty much so merged into one organization. So we're we're really working together and getting a lot of work done. But that's we're looking great. for somebody that understands fast charging better than we do, Nathan. So um, <laughs> gonna have I'm gonna take your name and your company and uh, get away to talk to you privately. I put I put my name and number there in the messages, and then I've got your number. I will reach out to you, Rap, after this, probably tomorrow or something like that, and get the conversation started. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yes, sir. Gentlemen, it's always good to see you. I'm going right. to sign off here. It's 8 o'clock. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Appreciate it. Thanks again, Nathan, and we'll see everyone uh, next month. Thank you. John? Thanks, guys. Great. Bye.